So this month, we're very lucky to have Professor Forrest Fleischmann, from, um, who's a, a professor of environmental policy at the University of Minnesota, to talk to us about, can we plant our way out of climate change, which is one of those $64,000 questions, isn't it? Um, he received his PhD in 2012 from Indiana University, where he studied with um, Eleanor Orstrom, who was a Nobel laureate political economist. So he again comes from perhaps not that biology background that I come from, but has a really interesting and different perspective. He's published research on a wide variety of forest policies and their implementation, and most importantly, their impact. And he's worked in South Asia, Mesoamerica, and in the United States. So I'm really excited to hear his talk tonight about about forest-based carbon storage, and actually from that really interesting global perspective. So Forrest, thank you so much for coming along and we're really looking forward to hearing from you. Thanks a lot. Over to you. Thank you, Sandra. Uh, I, hope, I hope I'm coming clear um, from, from far away. Uh, yep, you're perfect. <laughs> great. All right, I would like to start my talk by showing you that there is a great enthusiasm around the world for tree planting and other forms of forestry as a solution for climate change. And um, you know, just some examples here that I pulled out of the news um, over on Sunday. Um, some of these are a little old. So there you have a picture of President Trump when he was president. He was going to promote planting lots of trees in the United States. Um, you know, you have lots of trillion trees initiative, you have big, the Wall Street Journal, you know, someone is, is investing $200 million in a carbon offset startup that happens to be partly based here where I live in Minnesota. Um, airlines are promoting tree planting, lots of different things going on. And what I want to discuss in this talk is what's the potential here? I have eight main messages. First of all, I want you to know that forests have a small but important role in reducing climate change risks. So to answer the, the question at the beginning of the talk, there is no one solution to climate change. Climate change is such a big problem that we need many solutions. Forests have a small role among those many solutions. Forests are also threatened by climate change and the demand for agricultural exports. And one of the problems we see on this slide is that forests are also being promoted as something we can do without taking the real actions we need on climate change. So it, it's sort of a greenwashing where we say that we're doing something because we're doing something about forests, but we're not addressing the larger task of eliminating fossil fuel consumption. Widely promoted forest-based climate policies have not worked well. Uh, these includes a lot of the policy options that are popular that you may have heard of and that tie people's individual actions. You can buy something and someone will do something to protect the forest somewhere else. So I'm going to highlight tree planting and carbon offsets as examples of these that are not working as well as, as maybe a lot of the hype would lead you to believe. There are other highly effective scientifically validated approaches to uh, using forests to address climate change. Uh, I'm going to talk about land back to indigenous and forest dependent people, direct government support for improving forest management. I'll talk a little bit less because it's not really my field, but also increasing markets for long-lived renewable forest products. So things like mass timber where you can build large buildings with only wood. Point number six, equity and justice are essential for effective action. And point number seven, money matters, but it's not always in the ways that you might think. A lot of these problems that I'm gonna talk about today are not problems that are addressed through primarily through financial exchanges. And the last point I want to make is this is 2022. We've been not taking the actions we needed on climate change for my entire adult life. And the result is our, our options are limited and every option we look at is gonna come with many difficult trade-offs. Climate change is caused by the consumption of wealthy people. People like you, you, I presume, I don't know who's listening to this, but most of the people, if you're in the UK or in the United States, you are a globally wealthy person. And it's our consumption 
that drives climate change. But climate change is threats are, are greatest for poor people. And on the bottom of this picture, of this slide, you can see a picture from a recent paper showing what percentage of India will have wet bulb temperatures in the 30s Celsius. Uh, in, uh, on, the, on, on my left, slide B shows right now, and slide D shows a scenario prediction for what it will look like in 50 years. And the, the, the deep red temperatures are temperatures that are basically unsurvivable. They're wet temperatures above 35 degrees Celsius, which means that your body can't sweat to cool off. And you'll notice that this scenario shows that most areas of India will have wet bulb temperatures above 35 degrees Celsius. Uh, and large areas of most, of most of Bangladesh, large areas of Pakistan as well. So we have hundreds and hundreds of millions of people who are, whose basic lives are threatened by climate change. But wealthy people do not want to change their behavior, and they have a lot of political power. So when they promote solutions, they tend to promote solutions that require less change and that displace any harms, any trade-offs that come with those solutions away from them, away from, say, the United States and Europe, and towards poor people in developing countries. So that's a theme I'll return to. So why do we need to store carbon in forests? Well, these are simple figures from uh, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental P Panel on Climate Change report that was published just last month. Uh, on the left, you see up to 2020, you can see the current rate of change in global surface temperature. And it's rising pretty steadily. And then we can see a number of scenarios for how it will continue to rise for the next 80 years. And you can see we have a light blue scenario, which is it's not going to rise that much and it will it will level off and even start decreasing a little bit by 2100. We also have the dark red scenario, which is that it's just going to keep going straight up, up to five degrees of average global surface temperature change. We'd like to be on that bottom level. We'd like to get as little climate change as we can, because climate change will have catastrophic consequences for many people and for ecosystems. And to get there, we need to look at where is climate change coming from? So on the right, you can see a graph of, of where climate change is coming from. And the blue, which is by far the largest category, is carbon dioxide from fossil fuel consumption. It's about 60 to 65% of emissions. The yellow is forests and land use. It's about 10%. So we'll return to that 10% number. The other numbers, if you can't read, read it on your, on your screen, methane is red, nitrous oxide is blue. So there's other, or, or maybe that's like a very dark blue. Uh, so there's other sources. Forestry is important. It's 10%. This is a very active slide. I apologize. This is from that same IPCC report. And it says, well, we've got lots of options to reduce carbon emissions across many sectors of our economy between now and 2030. And I wanna point out the different colors here. The light blue color is costs are lower than the reference. These are things that cost less than not taking any action. And so you can see the big light blue areas are wind and solar energy, which already cost less than many alternatives. And um, a whole bunch of changes in the transport sector like more efficient vehicles, electric vehicles, uh, putting little wingtips on airplanes that make them a little bit more fuel efficient. These are all things that it, it, everyone should be doing. Costs go up, things that are dark red are still pretty expensive. So in the middle of my slide, uh, I have highlighted in purple, the forestry. Again, you're gonna see if you add up all these numbers, forestry is around 10% of the total potential. It's not the cheapest. There's no light, there's none of the blue in forestry, but there is some yellow and orange in forestry. 
And most of that is in reducing the conversion of forests and other ecosystems. But there's also a significant potential in ecosystem restoration, some of it's pretty expensive, and improving sustainable forest management. Forests, at the same time, are being threatened by climate change. So in this picture, these are a couple of pictures from, taken by my colleagues here at the University of Minnesota of climate change affecting forests right here where I live. So on the left, you see a forest of Douglas fir, very common boreal species in Northern Minnesota. But you see the understory is all broadleaf trees. They're all maple trees. So we're already getting a change. It used to be good for growing fir there. Now it's good for growing maple. On the other side, you see a birch forest and all the trees are dead. All the, all the large trees are dead because there was a drought probably related to climate change. And here where I live, we are likely to see dramatic changes in our forests. This is from another paper by my colleagues here at the University of Minnesota. And on the left, you can see the current distribution of ecosystems in our region. So we have a lot of sort of tan, which is broadly forest, green, which is mixed forest, and blue, which is boreal forest. Obviously, the dark blue are the Great Lakes of North America. And on the far left, we have prairies, grasslands. They ran a whole bunch of different scenarios. And depending on which scenario you choose, you get different outcomes of what forests will have in 50 years. But the important thing I want you to see is that boreal forest is gone from our entire region in every single one of these scenarios, except for a tiny little patch on the North Shore of Lake Superior. So even the scenario with the least change predicts dramatic change in the forests of this area. The scenario with the most change predicts there won't be any forest here where I live anymore. It'll all be too hot and dry for forests. It'll all be a prick. Forests are also threatened by commercial agricultural expansion. That's the single largest driver of deforestation in the world. So on the right, you can see a soybean field carved out of the Amazon basin. On the left, you can see a palm oil plantation in Indonesia. In the middle, you see another driver of, of, of deforestation, which is just the building of roads. So the building of infrastructure allows more people into an area, and then there tends to be deforestation after that. I want to make an important point here, which is a point that I was confused on for many years until I began studying this. Many people think of logging as a driver of deforestation. Logging is not a driver of deforestation. Most loggers do not want to cut down every tree and then convert that land into something else. They want to be able to come back and log that area time and again as the forests regrow. That kind of logging is not a threat to forest persistence, but it can change forest structure and function. If you build roads into an unroaded area, uh, then maybe people will come on those roads and start illegally farming there. That will lead to, to, to deforestation. But logging by itself is not a threat to forest persistence. It can, in fact, be beneficial, a point I'll return. Underlying the expansion of agriculture are other factors that re rely on government policies and economics. So many people who live in forested areas don't have secure land tenure. They don't have property rights to their land. Governments are eager, eager to seek export revenue from commercial crops and often drive people out of their forest-based livelihoods to make room for large-scale agriculture. There's powerful people who profit from these, for, these forces. And there's a huge demand for commercial agricultural products that's, again, particularly driven by wealthy consumers like you and me. Many governments incentivize deforestation. They provide subsidies to agriculture. They require you to clear land as a way to claim it legally. And they discriminate against indigenous and forest dependent people. So those are all the threats to forest. There's a lot of people who are claiming that they're gonna solve these problems, but they're often using this as an excuse for inaction on fossil fuel reduction. 
So I was looking for an image of this, and I found out that in Canada, Shell, the gas company, the oil and gas company, the energy company, I should say, will sell you carbon neutral gasoline. How is that possible? Well, they promise that they will plant trees or protect forests every time that you buy gas from them. There's a problem here. Forests are not big enough to sequester all the fossil fuel emissions. We can go back a few slides and see this. Forests are about 10% of the potential. Forests are about 10% of emissions. So we don't have enough space for everyone to sequester their, their, uh, their carbon emissions by planting trees or protecting forests. Even getting to this 10% will require dramatic changes in food production in people's lives with potentially catastrophic impacts on poor food consumers. If we decide that we need more forests to soak up carbon emissions, it means we're deciding we are going to grow less crops. And crops are what people eat. Many potential areas where we can protect and restore forests are places where it's not very likely to do so. And I just wanna point out, here's at the bottom is a map of where the most potential is to store carbon in forests. The dark green are the most carbon rich forests. Some of them are in fairly sparsely populated areas like the Amazon basin. Some of them are in very densely populated areas like Central America or parts of Southeast Asia. So that presents a real challenge. We need to figure out a way that those people can continue to live and also work with these forests and carbon storage. Last fall, colleagues of mine and some of the big conservation NGOs published a paper in which they proposed a forest carbon hierarchy. I think this is a very important idea. What are the most important sources where we can store this 10% of, of the world's carbon that we want to store? They say the most important place to focus is on protecting forest. That is the orange. The next most important is sustainable management. That's the sort of olive green. And the least, the, the least lowest priority is restoration. I want to point out a few things about this figure. The size of the circles represent the total potential carbon that could be stored. Protect has the smallest total circle. So there's the least carbon that we can remove from the atmosphere by protecting existing forests. But the inner circle is what's feasible at current prices. And it's quite large relative to restoration. So we have the greatest potential to store carbon through re forest restoration, but it's, it's, it's the most costly way to do it. The, the lower cost ways are protection and improved management. And the reason that they say, and I'll, I'll return to this, the reason that they prioritize protection is all these funny little pictures they put in there. So uh, protection has the greatest benefits to, to biodiversity, which they put in there as a hummingbird. Existing intact forests are the best place for, biodiverse, for pr protecting biodiversity. There's also the least conflict with it, existing land use, because there's no requirement to change any land use. So what are some policy options that we can work that work to protect forests? Well, I was involved in a systematic review of this in Central America, and I'm putting a figure up here. The short story is that we found three powerful policy tools to protect forests. The first one is creating protected areas. This was the most studied, uh, the most studied policy. And in the center of this figure, we have the number of studies in Central American countries that found positive impacts from protected areas was 42. But we also found 13 studies that showed negative impacts on forests from protected areas. So protected areas don't always work. 
Just today, I saw a paper was published in Nature uh, looking at protected area impacts on wildlife. It's not always positive. The reason is protected areas don't always work, a point I'll come back to. The second most studied policy was community-based land management and clarifying land tenure. This one was more likely to be positive. We found more positive cases. Uh, although we found fewer total cases, that's just a measure of how many people had studied it. It's not a measure of how effective it is. So those are very powerful tools. And then we found many positive impacts from uh, incentive programs, from what's sometimes called payments for ecosystem services. So paying existing landowners to manage their lands in certain ways. These are powerful tools to protect forests, existing forests. I want to point out restricting logging does not protect forests, but it may be important to protect some species that need older forests or are very sensitive to disturbance. The big negative, we found agricultural subsidies often have negative impacts on forests. And programs to help people's well-being sometimes have negative impacts and sometimes have positive impacts on forests. So I mentioned protected areas are not always effective. Uh, protected areas also create substantial risks to people. There's very widely varying estimates, but somewhere between 10 and 173 million people have been displaced from their homes to create protected areas around the world. Uh, just to give you a sense, right now, the UN High Commission of Refugees estimates there's 82 million people displaced worldwide. This number has presumably gone up. Uh, this is 2021, so before the U Ukraine war. Uh, but this included 4 million Venezuelans, 6 million Palestinians, almost 7 million Syrians. So the number of people displaced by protected areas is, is like several large and catastrophic wars at best. And even when not displacing people, protected areas can alter people's prosperity and are often used by dictatorships as a tool for social control. So protected areas can be very effective. But, uh, and they may be necessary to conserve some disturbance of our species, but they come with a lot of problems and they're not always effective. A tool that may be more effective is to give land back or to secure the rights of indigenous and other forest dependent people. Uh, the map that you see on the right shows the amount of carbon stored in current indigenous and uh, community based managed lands in some of the most biodiverse and carbon rich countries in the tropics. And it's just very, very, very large amount of carbon stored on those lands. And about half of these lands, the people who manage and live in those places do not have land rights. So they're living there, they're conserving these lands, but the government any day could come in and sell their land to someone else and take that carbon away. So securing uh, those lands is very important. Um, and we also know uh, on the left, I have a study done by some colleagues of mine here in the upper Midwest, and it's about forest regeneration. I'm not gonna go into all the details because I'm assuming most of you aren't familiar with the upper Midwest, but I wanna point out that the two groups on the right that show much higher forest regeneration are indigenous managed lands in the state of Wisconsin in the US. And the lowest regeneration is in the Apostle Islands National Park. So these indigenous managed lands are being better managed than US national parks or national forests in terms of several measures that this paper looks at, including forest regeneration. We can also give people incentives, and this is, is quite common here in Minnesota where I live, the state government gives payments to landowners who, who manage their forests sustainably. We can also have things like the sustainable palm oil or sustainable soy, which are certifications that companies can get for their, uh, their food products to show that they were produced without deforestation and that may command a premium price. There can be a lot of problems with these kind of incentive payments uh, because there can be a lot of leakage. So for example, if I decide I'm only gonna buy sustainably produced palm oil, that'll drive up the price of palm oil that's sustainably produced. Someone else is gonna make palm oil cheaply 
and sell it to consumers who don't care about sustainability. So that's called leakage. It's, it's not necessarily doing an absolute uh, improvement. All of these things require secure land tenure. So they won't work in many places in the global south unless we first secure the people who are managing the lands, give them land rights and make sure that they can defend those land rights in courts and in, the court, in, in, in government policies. So you, in order to pay someone to manage their land better, that person has to know that they're going to get the benefit and if we go back here, I said half of these indigenous community and community conserved lands do not have those kind of things. Additionality is often a problem. What's additionality? It's difficult to know what a landowner would have done otherwise. So if I own some forest land and I say, I'm gonna cut down the forest unless you give me a payment. Well, maybe I would have cut down the forest or maybe I wouldn't. Maybe I just said that to get the payment. And I'll come back to this. Most of what are called forest carbon offsets rely on a model which predicts how the landowner would have behaved. We never know if that model, how good that model is, because we can never observe the same person if they got the payment and if they didn't get the payment. Um, something that I hear a lot, well, we need to produce more food and less land area in order to conserve forests. That's probably true, but it's really complicated. Um, so I, I, I'll just say that um, this is probably not the high priority solution that some agronomists like to make it out to be. And in particular, a lot of deforestation is being driven by what would really be more luxury commodities. So we could also get the same impact by maybe consuming less palm oil or consuming less animal products, which are often fed soybeans that come from deforestation. Uh, and last point about all of this is that climate change impacts happen regardless of whether you protect the forest from deforestation. Manage, improved management is another potential tool. Improved management means managing forests for commercial timber production, but in a way that maximizes the carbon benefit. So this may mean longer rotations. You grow each tree longer, so it stores more carbon. It also matters a lot what you do with the tree after you harvest it. A lot of trees here in Minnesota, we have a very diverse forest products industry. We cut down a lot of trees to make paper. And most paper ends up in the landfill and it doesn't really get stored for very long. But if we use it instead to make a substitute for a steel I-beam, so this is what this picture here is showing you. The steel I-beam is the amount of carbon storage you get if you uh, both cut down the tree, you, then you grow another tree there. So you're getting new carbon stored. And then instead of using steel to build a building, steel is very carbon intensive to produce, you use that wood. And now that wood, the carbon in that wood is stored long-term and you didn't produce all that steel. So you get a huge benefit in terms of decreasing the amount of carbon emitted to the atmosphere and storing lots of carbon long-term in a building. Uh, management, it provides an incentive for people to keep land in forests. So if your forest is worth more because you can harvest it, you're less likely to convert your land into annual crops and lose the carbon. So the, the better forest products markets we have, particularly for these kind of long-lived forest products, not necessarily pulp and paper, but structural lumber to build long-lasting buildings, um, we, we can store more carbon. There are a lot of trade-offs here. Um, different kinds of forests, it works out really differently. It matters a lot what you do with the wood after you harvest it. Uh, it's important to note that not all forest species and values persist well in, in managed forests. So some uh, wildlife species need to live in unmanaged forests or at least forest managed on very long rotations. And so the more intensively you manage a forest, you may lose the amount of carbon stored on that site. But again, depending on what you do with the timber, you may get a benefit and you lose some of the biodiversity and ecosystem service benefits. Less intensive management might produce more on-site carbon storage benefit, 
but it might mean that we need to manage more forests to produce wood products. So if we reduce the production of, of forests in the, in the US, we might start buying forests from places, buying wood from places where forests are less sustainably managed. Restoration is the lowest priority tool, but it has the greatest potential. Why is it low priority? It's basically low priority for two reasons. One is it's more expensive than protecting an existing forest or managing an existing managed forest. Start, starting a forest from scratch costs money. And it's also slower. If we prevent a forest from being cut down today, then that carbon is, is stored. If we plant a forest now, it might take 20 or 30 years for it really to start accumulating large amounts of carbon. Restored forests may have the least co-benefits as well. Co-benefits are things like biodiversity or watershed reduction. Again, eventually a planted forest might get there, but initially a, a planted or restored forest may have fewer habitats for wildlife. Restoration when it's agroforestry on small farms, so people planting, say, fruit crops around their homes or, or on their farm, that might have really big benefits for their well-being. They might get more profitable crops. On the other hand, if everyone on the world replaces their corn, wheat, soy, and rice fields with orchards, we might get lots of mangoes and apples and not a lot of bread and rice. And I have occasionally gotten some really good mangoes and tried to spend the day just eating mangoes, and I ended up spending the day on the toilet. You need to eat a, mi a mixed diet. So we, there's some limits to this. There's a lot of trade-offs here between how much carbon we store, how profitable a restoration product project is, and what its human well-being impact is. So we need to restore sites thinking really specifically about a specific place, what are the goals for the specific place, what are the needs of the local people. I want to emphasize that restoration is not the same thing as planting trees. In most contexts where it's been studied, it's both cheaper and faster to restore forests just by allowing the forest to regenerate naturally or by planting trees, but not planting trees really densely. Sometimes they're planting trees so that their seeds will reforest, so they'll provide some shade for other species to come in. You're not planting every tree that's going to be on that site in 20 or 30 years if your goal is restoration. Sometimes, however, you do need to plant a lot of trees. You might want to get a, a specific species mix, say because the certain species are valued. The site might be an urban area where it's hard to regenerate trees naturally, or it might be an area, say, where fires are really common and they're preventing natural regeneration. So sometimes we need to plant trees. An important thing to understand about the high priority areas for restoration from a carbon standpoint, they're mostly in the humid tropics. They're mostly on people's farms. So I want to point out on the top, you have in purple the areas where there's the greatest potential to store carbon by restoring forests. And here uh, in the middle, you have in yellow and orange where population density is high, and they're often the same places, and they're often in poorer countries. So we're talking about poor people's farmland being a major place where we want to put forest restoration. This should be a concern to everyone. There might be a really big trade-off between the optimal way to get a lot of carbon stored and people's well-being. So this is just a, a paper I'm working on right now with some colleagues looking at one of these schemes that says, where is the highest priority? Where are the highest priority places? They're in light green on this map for forest restoration based on carbon storage, and based on biodiversity benefits. And they say, we should restore almost 100% of the farmland in the country of Equatorial Guinea, very close to 100% of the farmland in the Philippines, 87% of the farmland in Nicaragua, 83% of the farmland in Nepal, and only 0.14% in the United States. I think this should be a concern. Why is it that we're, we're pursuing a policy that says 
wealthy people's farmland, oh, we don't need to worry about that that much. But poor people's farmland, we need to take that away and turn that into forests. That's a concern. I'm going to go through this a little bit briefly, but this is my own research about restoration in, in the foothills of the Himalayas in India. There's a picture of the landscape we're working in. And in this area, there's a long history of afforestation aimed at improving forest cover and achieving environmental and social goals. As you can see from this graph, the 1980s and 1990s, the government was planting lots of trees in this area. So it's now 30, 40 years after those tree planted. We should expect the areas where those plantations happened to see a big increase in the amount of trees growing there. And what we saw instead is on this top graph, it's a little difficult to interpret, but what we should have seen is that in year zero, which is the pinkish line, you should start to see a trend upward in the forest cover, in the density of the forest, actually, is what this is mentioned. Instead, we see it, actually, there's a trend downward. It's, it's not statistically distinguishable from zero. So there's no impact on the density of the forests from these tree planting programs. But on the bottom, you can see there is a decline in the number of forests that have broadleaf trees. This is concerning. It's not surprising because they were planting mostly needle leaf trees, but it's concerning because it turns out that broadleaf trees in this landscape are much better for biodiversity and much better for people's local needs. For, they make better firewood than the pine. They, they produce fodder that goats can eat. We have not yet measured, uh, we're working on it now, but we haven't measured carbon storage in those forests yet, or we haven't, we haven't analyzed the data yet. Uh, why are these plantations so bad? Why are they not working? Well, we looked at recent plantations and we found that about 40% of them were in areas that already had dense forest. So they weren't gonna change the density. It was already pretty dense. Or they were in areas that were had a, a pretty uh, low probability of survival of the trees. And we looked at the impact on, on human beings from these plantations. There's a lot of enthusiasm that planting trees is good for people. And there's also a lot of concern that I've already expressed that maybe if we do these large scale restoration projects, there's gonna be human rights violations, people are gonna be removed from their land. And we actually found mostly there wasn't much impact. Impacts were modest, but some people are migratory pastoralists. They move their sheep up and down the Himalayas, depending on the season. And the, these plantation programs really were a problem for their livelihoods. How can we address this? Well, our study seems to show, and we're applying for more funding to look at this more closely, that we get improvements in forest cover and more beneficial livelihood outcomes when Villages have more local collective action and are more involved in making the decisions. I also want to point out we did not look in the study in agroforestry, and there's a, a group out of Oxford that just published a paper that says that in India, where we were looking, there's probably more potential uh, forest carbon storage from agroforestry than from uh, the kind of plantations we are looking at. So what are we doing? Uh, well, if you look at glo big global commitments made by companies and governments to, to use forests as a tool to address climate change, most of these targets or most of these commitments focus on planting trees or creating carbon offsets. I just want to point out, this is an analysis uh, by Simon Lewis and colleagues from a few years ago. And in the middle, he says, current plans are maintained. Here's how much carbon we can protect, we can, we can store 16 petagrams of carbon with the current commitments of global governments, 2019 commitments of global governments. But if we focused on natural forests instead of plantation forests, we'd be able to store 42 petagrams of carbon. Now, remember, I said there are some potential trade-offs here. Maybe some of those plantation forests that are leading to only 16 that have less carbon in them because they're plantations. Maybe if they're harvesting them and putting them into long-lived wood products, 
Maybe that's an underestimate. This paper did not look at that. Carbon offsets are when you buy carbon storage to make up for an emission elsewhere. So, you know, you're buying your plane ticket and they say, do you want to offset your flight? We're going to plant some trees or protect some forests somewhere else. This might make sense in some sectors, particularly aviation. It's going to be very hard for us to decarbonize aviation. We don't have immediately available technologies to do that. So we can allow the market to figure out where the best place to do this is. And this could provide incentive payments, which remember I said are pretty effective, to forest owners or managers to practice more carbon storing forestry. There's a lot of different markets being developed to do this, but unfortunately, these markets are just flooded with low quality and fraudulent offsets. So I will tell you people, because I'm an expert in this, people ask me, well, where should I buy my forest carbon offsets? I have no idea. Um, I have people tell me, I have a former PhD student who's working for a company. She says that they're doing a good job, but there's so many offsets that we're finding out are either total frauds or they're low quality. They're not really doing what they're saying they're doing. Maybe they're saying that they're protecting an area that would have been protected anyway, or they're putting in tree plantations like the ones I studied in India, that it turns out when you go back 30 or 40 years later, there's no evidence that they worked. Many of the problems I, I talked about earlier in this talk that are barriers to forest restoration and barriers to forest protection are not about money. So how do you give money to someone to give secure land tenure to indigenous people in say Brazil or India? Well, I don't know how to do that. It's not a money problem, it's a politics, it's a legal problem, it's about political power of different groups. Maybe you could give money to those indigenous people to build a political movement to protect their lands. But that's not gonna translate into the kind of thing that the airline says it's selling you. We're gonna sell you this much carbon storage based on how much you emit. There's also problems I've mentioned with additionality. I've mentioned all this already, additionality and leakage. You cannot prove that your offset costs additional carbon storage because you never know what would have happened if you hadn't paid that entity to store that carbon. Maybe the carbon would have been stored anyway. Furthermore, protecting a forest in one place may increase harvesting or deforestation elsewhere. If we prevent agriculture from taking over forestry in one place, maybe that drives up the price of agricultural products and leads someone else to clear forest in another place. Finally, the problem with offsets is that we need to take, it's 2022, we've known about this problem my entire life essentially. We need to be, be taking every possible action against, against climate change at this point. So saying, well, we'll allow some pollution as long as it pays for forestry is kind of a problem because we don't have room left in our carbon budget to do that. So what can you do? I'm, I'm sort of critical, particularly of forest carbon offsets because I think that people are using them as excuse to not reduce their fossil fuel consumption. But if we focus on the major causes and uses of fossil fuels, wealthy consumers have huge opportunities to reduce our consumption of these, often at pretty modest cost. If you own land or if you are a forester, you can manage your land for long-term carbon storage. You, can, you as a consumer can buy sustainably produced long-lived wood products and you can combine your individual actions with collective action for policy advocacy and change. I just wanna highlight some really uh, simple things that we can all be doing to, uh, to reduce our, 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 our emissions of fossil fuels. We can reduce our consumption of transportation by using buses, trains, and bicycles rather than cars and airplanes. Um, you can move to a place where you need less transportation. And since I'm talking to people in the UK, I think you all live in places that need less transportation than where I live in the US. That's a problem with our zoning codes. We encourage people to sp spread out and drive their cars really long distances. We can reduce the consumption of electricity in our, and, and gas in our buildings. Heat pumps and insulation are readily available tools that can improve the efficiency of our buildings. And we can reduce our consumption of climate intensive products. We can advocate for better policies like 
policies that encourage density and mass transit, more energy efficient buildings in urban areas. We, we can support public investment in these public transit, renewable energy, and we can support indigenous and forest dependent peoples advocacy for land rights and for land tenure security. Finally, we can support climate smart forestry, largely through improving markets for sustainable long-lived products. So I wanna just put up as my last slide, these eight main points and thank you for, your, for, for listening. Thank you so much, Forrest. That was really fascinating, really, really interesting. And, and it's really nice to end with something that people can actually do because sometimes these problems feel so big that it feels like an individual can't, can't really do anything about it. And I think distilling that, you know, that kind of big global story down to kind of individual actions is a really, is a really great way to end that talk and perfect for the society. Um, we've got a lot of different questions coming, some of which have are, you've answered in your talk, so I probably won't get to those. Um, but what um, someone has asked, is it clear that giving forests to forest dwelling people to manage will result in good forest management? Or is this, uh, is the North American experience typical here? Might not more materially impoverished peoples, like in South America, be tempted to deforest the land entrusted to them so they can move into agriculture to increase incomes and sell to mining interests, etc.? This is a great question. Um, and I, I the, the first part of the answer to the question is um, any one of these policy tools is not going to be something that works 100% of the time. So I can guarantee you that if we give land back to all the indigenous people in the world, some of those indigenous people will sell their land to mining companies or will uh, clear their land for agriculture. But this has been very intensively studied. I use an example from where I live in Wisconsin, but actually this has been most intensively studied in Mexico, Brazil, Colombia, and Peru, and which are the which are countries that have given large amounts of land to indigenous people, um, and I think there's several others that I'm not thinking of off the top of my head that where this has been studied, and we have now been studying this for 30 years, and every single study that I've seen comes out with th these indigenous indigenous people when they get land rights they conserve the land, on average. So I'm not saying it's 100%, maybe it's 75%, but that's actually better than what we get from protected areas because a lot of protected areas, particularly in the developing world, uh, are, end up being what we call paper parks. So, so the answer is yes, this, this is a proven tool and it's been proven exactly in places like South America. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, I, you know, it on average, I suspect that it, it really does because there's always people who people are people vary, don't they? Um, so another question is, and it's kind of more of a comment, is about clear felling and replanting is much less effective in removing carbon dioxide than the Bradford seven year system, i.e. fell one mature tree and plant one new tree in a 49 tree block every year. So that sounds like a kind of plantation type forestry thing. So um, it's not really a question, but kind of a comment. I wondered if you wanted to comment on that. Well, I'll say first of all that that this is this is a silviculture question, and I'm in a forestry department, so I would sort of tend to refer this to my colleague who does. <laughs> but my understanding of the literature is there are a lot of different systems, and they're appropriate for different forest types. So here in in North America, we have some forest types where the natural cycle is they would burn or get killed by beetles every 100 years and then start over. Mm -hmm. And clear felling is actually a lot closer to the natural cycle of those forest types than something where you take out a few trees each year. Yeah. But also have a lot of forest types which don't naturally burn or, or have large scale deaths where selective harvesting of individual trees can be more sustainable. A problem with selective harvesting is it requires many entries into the same stand. Yeah. And each time you go into a stand, you may be damaging trees, disturbing the soil. And so there are, there are benefits to each system. And I think as a young person who was interested in forestry, in ecological forestry, I was like, clear felling is bad. We should only do selection harvesting. And now that I've studied in a lot more depth, I understand that there's a reason why we have these different systems and they're good for different forest types and different goals. 
Yeah, I think I think that's a really important point you just made that that forests are not all exactly the same. The, the other thing I would say is in terms of wildlife benefits, um, you know, there's some wildlife that need old growth forests, but there's also some wildlife that need young regenerating forests. And we have uh, an endangered species here in the upper Midwest called the Kirtland's warbler. And it can only survive, I can't remember, I think it needs to be nest in stands that are, I think, between 10 and 20 years old, or maybe 20 to 30 years old. It has a very specific young forest type, and it's an endangered species. So we, mm -hmm. we manage for that endangered species as well. That means creating young forests. Yeah, it's, it's, it, it, is, it is quite, yeah, I grew up in New Mexico where, where forests burn a lot. Yeah. And, and that is, I mean, they don't, you know, when they don't burn too hot, you don't yeah. get all of the trees dying, but and that and that's of course changed a lot with climate change as well. You get these wildfires, which are Absolutely. much much hotter. Um, someone has asked about. There's a question about um, about agricultural subsidies. Is would you say that mm -hmm. agricultural subsidies for subsistence farming are as bad as subsidies for commercial farming? And the context in which this question is asked is that 86 of farm 86 percent of farmers in India are small and marginal, with less than two hectares of land. So I, I think this is a complicated question and I haven't studied it in depth. And there's a lot of different forms of agricultural subsidies. Um, but I can give an example, not from India, but from Mexico, where I've looked into this a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, working with my wife, uh, we, we, and I say we, I mostly mean she, interviewed hundreds of farmers and um, I helped her. And one of the things we found is that farmers get agricultural subsidies and the subsidies encourage them to do two things. They encourage them to clear more forest for because they get a per acre subsidy and they encourage them to clear more forest because they get a, a per cow subsidy and for each cow, you need more pasture. They also get subsidies that are um, subsidizing their well-being without subsidizing them for clearing more forest. Um, so these are, are basically, uh, 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 what, what's the generic term for them? The generic, the generic term would be livelihood. <laughs> so mm -hmm. they get a certain amount of money from the government each year. In Mexico, it was tied to keeping your kids in school. If your kids stay in school, you get a certain amount of money per year yeah. to, to support your kids. And that, does not incentivize deforestation. So we can help poor people live better lives without incentivizing deforestation, or we can help them live better lives by incentivizing them to deforest. Yeah, should, so, so subsidies that, can be for lots of things, it's true. Yeah, and yeah. in that system in Mexico, that it was very low productivity agriculture. So well, meant, cattle, cattle ranching generally is, and it gets yeah. lower productivity with time, doesn't it? Because yeah. the pastures lose, lose fertility. Um, uh, somebody's also asked if there is an accreditation scheme, and you kind of addressed this in your talk, but I just wonder, is there room in, in kind of this ecosphere of offsetting, which is immensely complicated, is there, is there room for an accreditation scheme um, for offsetting schemes, if you see what I mean? You know, is there, a, yes. do you think there's a way of doing that? There could I think be a way that, of doing that. I think there is, and people are working on it. I think it's it's kind of a work in progress. And um, uh, so I'll say two things. One is uh, here in the United States, California has an, a forest offset scheme as, that's regulated by the state of California. And its offsets seem to be somewhat reputable. They've come under a lot of criticism lately. And I'm not an expert, so I don't feel like I can a judge between the people who are arguing about whether or not they're reputable or not. Yeah. But at least more reputable than the, the places I've seen where it's clear that like the money was never spent or where they're planting trees in some ecosystem where they're destroying a savanna to plant trees. Um, so this they're not doing that with the California system because there's a regulator watching over it. And mm -hmm. I think there's potential for that to happen on a larger scale and people are working on it. I just don't know who's doing the right work on it yet. Yeah, so do you think that regulation um is a thing that should happen nationally or internationally? Uh, I think, well, you know, if you look at those maps of where the greatest potential for carbon storage is, it's in the tropics. And if you look at 
or there's a lot of money, it's in Europe, North America, East Asia. So I think that there's a need to have a conversation about how we can do this well internationally. I'm very concerned because many of the groups that are getting into forest carbon offsets in the developing world are either focusing on afforesting natural savanna ecosystems, which is very destructive to biodiversity, or they're doing things that are very destructive to local well-being. And this is, you know, there's just many, many reports of this happening. So I think we could think about a way to create a certification. I think my main concern with that would be to make sure that indigenous that, that the people who are potentially negatively affected, so indigenous and forest dependent people and small farmers in rural parts of the developing world have a strong voice in that certification. Mm -hmm. And I haven't seen anyone really do that yet. I see certifications coming up and they're being promoted by groups of, of big, big businesses from the first world. You know, Delta Airlines, which is, has a big hub here in Minneapolis, is always in on these because they want to do something good. But I want to make sure that indigenous and, and rural people in the developing world have a veto over Delta Airlines mm -hmm. and designing a, a political structure that enables that to happen might be pretty difficult because, you know, Delta Airlines is something like the largest airline in the world and they've got huge amounts of money and power. Yeah. Just using well, that as an yeah, it, it, it's interesting, but you know, but what, what's interesting is to look at investment, you know, if you look at it, the way people invest in the stock market, you know, it's kind of environmental, social and governance. So there can be a tripartite Absolutely. sort of way of looking at things. So it's not like it, it. And it seems odd that it's a single, a single sort of thing. But we're, we're, we're risk, I'm risking not asking, I'm just risking asking the questions that I want to ask. Um, so someone's also asked is, are the forest management trade-offs too complex for governments to reasonably get their heads around and otherwise adopt and fund in policy? So are these trade-offs actually too idealistic to be feasible? Well, I, I think one of the things um, I think about is I started college in 1998 and I had the very good fortune to go to Stanford University where there were a lot of really leading environmental scientists. And my first semester, I went to a talk and there were a bunch of the world's great environmental scientists were sitting around a round table discussing what to do about climate change in 1998. And they said, the 2000 election is gonna be the crucial election for climate change in the United States. Well, now it's 22 years after that election, 24 years after that talk. And we're at a point where everything involves really hard trade-offs. And we have to make decisions about which ones we're willing to, to, to make. Mm -hmm. and I think we can focus on some areas where I think there's pretty clear win-win. So I think land back to indigenous and forest dependent people is a pretty clear win-win. It's good, it's, it's good because of environmental justice concerns. Historically, us colonialist white people came and stole their land. We should give the land back to them regardless of climate change. And hey, it's good for climate change too. And hey, it'll improve their well-being. Um, so that's like a no brainer, but a lot of these things are going to involve trade offs and there, I think those trade offs need to be decided more locally. Because it's often the local people who are going to be affected, but I also think we need to design institutions that can represent the interests of a global population that says well we do need forests to address climate change so these are difficult and and political questions I don't think they're unresolvable, but I think we need to recognize that at least 25 years of delay means that we're, uh, we're, we're left with hard choices. It's, yeah, and we're getting near the edge of a cliff. Um, yeah. Something, someone has also, also asked a question, which is quite interesting, is, is about, um, could you say anything about the importance or the relative, the relative mitigating effects or roles of different types of forests? And you yeah. kind of touched on that a little bit when you talked about where the, you know, your map of where the, where the most, the forest that stores the most carbon is, but you know, is there is there anything else you'd like to say about? Yeah, that? so so you know, in general, places with longer growing seasons are going to store more carbon. So th there's two main limitations on growing seasons. One is uh, heat. So I live in Minnesota, and we've got five month growing season, and uh, you know, in the Amazon basin, they've got it's warm all year round. So, and then the other one is, is, is moisture. So most parts of the world have a wet season and a dry, wetter and a drier season. 
So there's many places that are warm all year round, but they have a short growing season because there's only water available in one season. So in general, you can think about if it's warm, all things being equal, if it's warmer or wetter, we're gonna store more carbon in that forest. Uh, I'll just say that one complication is that in places where there's snow, snow reflects heat and dark green needles absorb heat. So if we go to, to high latitudes, we actually don't want to aforest high latitudes. We want there to be snow there because mm -hmm. snow is going to reflect heat away from the earth. And if we replace that snow, let's say Northern Canada, we replace that snow with a dark green spruce tree, that's going to absorb heat all winter. So, so that's yet another trade-off. And the final one I'll say that's really special, there's two really special kinds of forests. Peat forests just store a huge amount of carbon because they have this organic layer of peat that forms in them. And mangroves are just like magical and amazing and have all kinds of benefits that are just really, really special. So those are kinds of forests that we should really be, mangroves and peat forests should really be conserved. And thinking about those those kinds of forests and if, and if if any of you who are watching didn't come to hear Yadvinder Mali's talk about I think about a month ago he showed the most extraordinary what is just one of the most interesting images of the basically the pulsating earth of sort of the the cycle of of productivity on the yeah. globe with the seasons it's extraordinary you know so it's worth going back to our YouTube channel and, and watching watching that one as well because it's a really good complement to this talk um so people have asked about forests, in, and you kind of touched on this a little bit, but about forests in places that actually weren't forests before. So, so right. someone's mentioned the Negev Desert, and you mentioned savannas, and, and there's the whole kind of 30 trillion trees in the EU saying we're going to plant 3 million trees. So how, how much of that is that kind of, is that sort of behavior outweighing um, what one might call proper afforestation? Uh, I, I think it's widespread, and unfortunately, there's some prominent scientists who've played a role in promoting it, um, which has been frustrating for me. Um, you know, I think there's an argument that's been made that we just need to store more carbon, and so to hell with ecosystems, we'll plant trees in them. The problem, and, and there are many, um, deserts are hard because to grow trees in, say, the Negev Desert, you need to bring in a lot of irrigation and- A lot of water. <laughs> That has its own energy costs, and so you may not, but there's lots of savanna ecosystems that can be converted to dense forest that get enough rainfall to grow trees, but the forests are controlled by fire or grazing. So we could store carbon in those systems by growing more trees. Mm -hmm. I think that there's really three main problems. One is it's incredibly ecologically destructive. And so one of my friends says, uh, you know, these people who want to plant, I can't remember how many, it's the Africa 100, so maybe it's 100 million trees in Africa. They want to plant trees in the places where the lions and the zebras live. And so we have to decide, do we want, again, these are the difficult trade-offs. Do we want trees or do we want to conserve lions? And we can't have both of them. Lions don't live in forests, they live in savannas. Yeah. Um, but the, the other thing about that trade-off there's two other things. One is some of these grasslands like snow have reflect heat. So that when, they, when they're dry grasslands, they're kind of brown and they light brown, they, or even a light green, they'll reflect heat away from the earth. So there's a, there's a reflectivity that we lose when we put trees in there. And the second thing that I, you mentioned being from New Mexico, Sandra, one of the things we've learned in the Western US is we grew denser forests, not really intentionally by mistake, by suppressing fire. And now we're getting these gigantic wildfires that are releasing all the carbon in these catastrophic events and destroying those forests. So there's modeling studies that say, um, I read a modeling study from California that says, if we can store more carbon, if we cut down every tree in California and manage it as a grassland, then if we grow trees everywhere we could possibly grow in California because grasslands store carbon below ground where it can't be burned by a fire. Yeah, It's a model, we're not gonna do that. But many of these places are, that we're going into plant trees and deserts and savanna ecosystems, those trees are just gonna burn down in a few years. Yeah, yeah. And that's the story that I showed you in India. There's lots and lots and lots of failure because of that. So that's a very 
a big problem. And as I say, there's a bunch of forest scientists who are unfortunately involved in promoting it. Uh, and I think, um, I think we, the savanna ecologists have made a big fuss about this and I think have been effective at least within the professional science community, it, now most people recognize, well, we need, to, we need to figure out where it's ecologically appropriate. Yeah, and I think that's that's one of that was one of the messages that certainly certainly was kind of resonating around the COP in Glasgow was about was about ecologically relevant tree planting, not just tree Absolutely. planting because you wanted to have a tree. You know, the the planting a tree and watching it grow is quite a different thing to planting a tree and going away and then planting another one ten Somewhere miles down else. the road. You know, it's it kind of and in our study sites in India, we found places where you know, the government has come back and planted trees three or four times over 30 or 40 years. And there's nothing growing there because it wasn't an ecologically appropriate site or maybe it was ecologically appropriate, but they needed to plant a different species. So without, so without harvesting in between? No, no harvesting. Just they planted the tree and it died. And then 10 years later, someone didn't remember they planted the trees there and they found that area still didn't have trees. They went back there. Yeah, now, um, so someone has asked a question about oceans and ocean sequestration of carbon. And does our, uh, um, someone says, I thought oceans sequestered more than terrestrial systems. So why are we not sequestering more carbon in the oceans? And since you're a for you're in a forestry department, it's a bit of an unfair question, really. Well, I, I think uh, I'll say it's, it's an unfair question. I don't know that much about it. Oceans do sequester huge amounts of carbon. They're a little bit less susceptible to human manipulation. So it, there's, uh, there's a little bit less than we can do to control what oceans are doing. Um, I have read that what we can do is encourage more whales to grow because apparently when whales die, they seek down, sink down deep in the ocean and the carbon in the whale gets stored, which is yep. kind of wild, but apparently that's whales. Are I have a, I have a colleague, exactly. I have a colleague who's at the Natural History Museum who studies whale falls. Which yeah, is that's really amazing. But any in any case, yeah. it's hard for human harder for humans to manipulate the ocean to store more carbon. And well, whales, it's interesting because if any of you who are from England who heard David Attenborough on the radio this morning talk about, you know, we can do things because humanity yeah. came together to save the whales. Yeah. We did it. And there are more whales swimming in the ocean than any time since anyone can remember. So yeah, absolutely. So, you know, we, we can do things, but it involves difficult trade-offs. I think. Um, now, I just, there's a lot of questions and some of them are sort of the same. So, um, so, so someone's asked, um, they're interested in your thoughts and the evidence that forest degradation in tropical temperate and boreal latitudes is likely to be a more significant factor than deforestation. Uh, forest degradation is more likely to be a significant factor than deforestation in reducing the global forest carbon reservoir and the forest carbon sink. So what about degradation versus deforestation? So I think historically deforestation has been much larger than degradation. Mm -hmm. um, and you can think about vast areas of the world that used to be forests and are now not. And now we're, we're running out of those places. So we don't have the vast forests that we used to. Of course, there's still regions of the world that still have vast forests, but there are a lot less of them. And so there's more attention being put to degradation. It's a little bit harder to study degradation um, because we can sort of see really easily if someone's growing corn or trees. It's a little harder to see from a satellite if the forest is degraded. That's something that my colleagues are working on, getting yeah. better at doing. But um, I think a lot of the same things that we've talked about here that apply, uh, deforestation and forest degradation have similar, although not identical drivers, and have similar, although not identical solutions. So, so I think it's an important distinction to make in some contexts. For example, in India, where I work, there's really not very much deforestation going on anymore, but there's still forest degradation that's being driven uh, by a variety of factors, but often simply by heavy local demands for firewood. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so one of the things that uh, one of my colleagues has shown is that if you give people uh, a gas stove, you restore the forest around. If you give everyone in the village a gas stove, you get for the forest stop degrading and, and get restored because- well, I saw a project in the high Andes in, in Argentina once where they had solar stoves. 
Mm -hmm. because essentially the polylepis forests have, have been cut down for firewood a long time ago. But people had yeah. these had these extraordinary solar solar stoves that were amazing. Yeah, so there, there's been a lot of challenges with these kinds of conversions because they don't work everywhere. Where mm -hmm. I work in Himalayas, this wouldn't work as well. No, too cloudy. The study was done. No, because people, people, it's cold there. So people burn, a lot of the wood that they burn is just for heating their themselves. They'll have a five mm -hmm. winter night when it's close to freezing. It's, and it's like that in the high so, Andes as well. Yeah. So a solar, a solar cook stove doesn't solve your problem of being cold at night. So, so you have to know something about the system to, to yeah. figure, figure that out. Yeah. Um, someone else has asked, is a globally agreed carbon, this is getting back to kind of policy again, is globally agreed carbon pricing mechanism the most crucial yet unfulfilled policy action governments must agree to support for us, or is there something else? And I think your answer is probably going to be there's lots of things. <laughs> I, I I think I think it's a it's a matter. So I've been very skeptical that we can get a forest carbon a, a carbon price that will work in the forest sector. And the reason is that many of the barriers to uh, to 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 protect, manage better, and restore forests are not financial. And so even if there's more money going into the forest sector, that won't necessarily translate into better protection management and restoration. No one would object to more money, but many of the problems have to do with things like power imbalances between indigenous people and a national government. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't think that, I, I think that a, a, a global carbon price would be very helpful in the fossil fuel sector, where it will be a lot easier to apply. Um, but I, I, I think it, it will just be really hard to make it work in forestry at a large scale. But at a small scale, it may provide some funding um, for some specific project. Additional money does make a difference. But I think it's gonna be really hard. I think that the, the solutions of you know, working politically to restore indigenous com community land rights. I keep coming back to that. You know, finding locally appropriate ways to restore that can make the landowners better off instead of, often we find restoration projects where they've actually just taken people's land away. And then the, the restoration projects fail because those people come back and burn down the trees. And like, well, no, there's lots of rest other restoration projects that you can find where people are sort of, how can we help these farmers grow more trees on their land in a way that's profitable for them? And then, so that's not, I mean, you need money to do that, but you also need local know-how, you need a bunch of research. So that's- You also need a collaborative, the will to collaborate. Yeah. Which and, is really important. And I'll just say that one of the things I've repeatedly seen in this sector is people from wealthy people coming into these rural communities where they wanna protect or restore and not doing the first thing, which is acting, asking those people what they need, learning about their lives, but instead making their own plans. And those always fail, but huge amounts of money get spent in these projects that are, that are locally inappropriate because no one asked the local people uh, what they already know. Sometimes the local people already know they're not growing trees for this reason. And they know they exactly won't grow. <laughs> is. they won't grow or Oh yeah, we tried that a few years ago and we couldn't get markets for the crops, so we cut down the trees. I mean, I've heard that many times. Um, yeah, it's interesting. It's like the kind of um, like the um, uh, like the 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 U.S. Department of of um, Drug Enforcement Agency coming in and and um, destroying coca crops in in the Andes and planting papayas for which there was absolutely no market. Yeah, exactly. So you you. you I think those locally develop that locally appropriate understanding. And that's something that money helps with, but it's not primarily about having a carbon price that's bringing money into the forest sector. It, it requires other things. Yeah, so, I mean, I think we've, 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 I mean, there's loads and loads of questions, but there's a lot of these you, you've answered in your talk or, or you've, you've answered in the answers to other questions. But one question, which is actually kind of a, I don't, I don't want to end on a downer one, so I'm going to have to think of a really good one for the end that's more positive. But, you know, is it, is it possible to do this? Can we do this fast enough to make a difference? Uh, so in principle, yes, we can. It, but it requires, 
everyone to invest in making massive change mm -hmm. in, in the world. And so I see this, you know, in my own neighborhood, I live in St. Paul, Minnesota, which is a decent sized city. And, you know, we're knocking down single family homes and putting up big apartment buildings, which is great because that means more people can live in our, in our dense transit served, you know, I'm a mile from a grocery store. I'm, I don't know, a three minute walk from a, not the college I work, but another college's campus. I can take the bus to the campus where I work in 15 or 20 minutes. Um, so it's great, but every single apartment building, there's a whole bunch of, of my lovely neighbors who will mobilize. We don't want apartments in our neighborhood. So if every single incremental change that we make on the climate, we need to have this huge battle over. And so we just need a massive mobilization to make this happen. And it's the same thing, the Brazilian Amazon, which is the largest, the largest intact body of, of tropical forest in the world. I think Russia has more forests in total, but they don't store anywhere near as much carbon per acre, uh, was making a lot of improvement for about a decade and a half under policies that were prioritizing the needs of the indigenous and local communities that live there. And then there was a big shift with the last election. And now the deforestation rate is skyrocketing because they changed their policies. So we, we need, in the forest sector, it's the same thing. We need to work on, on these areas where we know that there's tools that can work. And unfortunately, I would say, I'm concerned, and the reason I'm, I'm accepting these invitations to give talks is I'm concerned everyone's so focused on developing these forest carbon offsets that they're missing what really works in this sector, which are things like, yes, incentive payments work and forest carbon offsets can provide them, but you know, indigenous lands uh, are, are also a really effective tool that can be scaled up pretty quickly that, that can work. And we, in order to do that, it's not about money, it's about helping indigenous people organize for their political rights. Yeah, no, well, it's about equality, diversity and inclusion, isn't it? Yeah. Really? I mean, at the end of the day. But I think you've given us a lot to think about and you've given us a lot of actual things that we as individual people can do. Someone asked me the other day in an interview, they asked me, um, you know, if you lived in the United States, what would you be doing? And I said, well, I'd probably be a kind of extremely vociferous advocate for public transport because yeah. public transport is is i mean i don't think i could live anywhere where there wasn't public transport anymore <laughs> i completely yeah I, I i've heard that from a lot of people americans who move to europe and then try to come back to the u.s and it's very frustrating very very frustrating yeah so so i think you've given us some some really important effective actions that we as individuals can think about and they're sort of the there are things that we can do in our daily lives, but there are also things that we can think about that that make us think about because um, it's often we all, we often think about conservation and climate change and everything as something that's happening way out over there and that we can't have an effect on. But I think that you've given us things that we can do as individuals, but also some more global things we can think about, like like indigenous people's rights and and helping people with land tenure. That, that's something that that we can all think about and agitate for, which is which is really important. So Forrest, I we've kept you a really long time asking questions, but there have been so many interesting ones. And it was such an interesting talk and full of full of fantastic insights and some real food for thought. So thank you so much for coming. And um, in a few years time, we'll have you back and see if anything. Thank changed. you very much, Sandra. Thanks a lot for us. It was very fun. Good night, everybody.